Hi there, Steve Kaufman here again. Uh, I have my blog, The Lingbist on Language, and uh, of course the website, link, lingq.com. And today I want to talk about something that has been on my mind, and it has to do with the importance of good language content. Content is king in language learning. Uh, it comes to mind because uh, of some discussions we've had uh, on our forum at Link and elsewhere, or even on my blog. Uh, for example, people studying Portuguese, they say, um, I only want European Portuguese, or I only want Brazilian Portuguese. And, and someone said they were studying using Pimsleur for Chinese, but it seems to them that the Chinese in Pimsleur is not the way people speak in the street. And, of course, I say, if I remember my own learning, like, it doesn't matter. Uh, what's most important is that the content somehow be interesting because when you're starting out in the language it's very hard for me at the beginning to tell the difference between a Portuguese uh, someone from Portugal and someone from Brazil I'm very happy if I can see one but I'm not entirely sure what's more important is that the content be interesting and of course I see you know language learning content as sort of as, as being in two stages you have the beginning, the beginner content, which is the assimil and the teach yourself or any kind of beginner content, uh, which is necessarily simplified and not so interesting. And then you have most of the time that you spend on languages and language learning, which should be with authentic, interesting content that you chose because you find it interesting. Uh, that beginner period, the best kind of language learning content is interesting stories and uh, Russian Asimil, for example, is much better than say Teach Yourself. They have no English on their recordings and the stories are kind of funny for a while. Uh, but the Korean Asimil was hopeless. I bought it too and I didn't use it because it was it was just too boring. Um, a lot of the sort of beginner texts, they start with phrases uh, or they, um, uh, you know, disjointed phrases to illustrate a point of grammar or something, or phrases telling you what to say at the post office, the train station, and so forth. To me, that's wrong. That comes later. First, you have to build up an overall level of familiarity with the language, vocabulary, and so forth. Then you can go back and, and deal with certain phrase patterns, and hopefully they would, you know, give you a concentrated dose of this type of situation, that type of situation, and that can include then uh, wording that you might use um, in the you know in the barber shop uh, in the post office and so forth. But until you have built up this general familiarity with the language, all of these sort of specialized, targeted types of scenarios or or, or phrases are very difficult to digest, in my opinion. And I'm going to talk about what works for me. You can come on here and say everything you want, criticizing me and saying I'm wrong. I don't mind. Uh, happy to have all the different. Uh, points of view. I won't block anyone, anyone as long as they don't swear at me. But this is my feeling. When I want to start, when I start, the ideal is, is a story, a detective story, a, a historical story, a, a love story, anything that has a little bit of interest to it that goes from sort of episode to episode, 30 seconds long, relatively simple language. And the sooner you get off that, the better. Uh, another good example was what my uh, Brazilian tutor prepared a little diary of her and her kids and they went to the zoo and stuff like that. Simple stuff prepared using deliberately using simple language. Doesn't have to be too slow but it shouldn't be too fast and everything you listen to it many times. That's the beginner content but as soon as you possibly can get out of that and get into real content, interesting content. Now some people think that the content has to be graded, graded readers gradually more and more difficult. I don't believe that at all. I think there's two kinds of reading and listening. There is the simple stuff, which might be graded readers, or you might be reviewing uh, simple stuff that you did before, and that's what I would almost call the aerobic part. That's building up your general, you know, aerobic capacity, your fluency in the language. But you also need to do the heavy lifting. Go into stuff where there's a lot of unknown words, where but you're driven because you're interested. And that's what I did very early on in Russian, where I was reading Tolstoy. And, and on link, I was looking up every second or third word. It was, but I had the audiobook, so I could fight my way through the chapter and listen to it, read it again, listen to it. And I sort of alternated the easy stuff with the difficult stuff. I think you need to do both. It's good for the brain, in my opinion. Now, um, I was going to also on, on this whole Portuguese, Brazil versus Portugal. Uh, I listen to both. It doesn't matter to me. 
uh, I'm trying to build up my you know ability to understand the language but if you have some excellent content uh, let's say that I'm more interested in European Portuguese because I'm going off to Portugal on, on a holiday but uh, there's a, a, per, a person called Ruben Alves and I'll put the name in uh, somewhere in the, in the comments here who is a Brazilian educator and he has put out fabulous audio lectures uh, and I found the text on the internet which I was able to import into Link. I mean he's tremendous and I'm going to deny myself listening to him because I'm focused on European Portuguese. It doesn't matter. What matters is how interesting is the content. If there were an expert say in English on a subject that you were very interested in and that person spoke with an Australian accent I mean I think you would be foolish not to listen to him uh, if you were interested in that subject because you'll build up a lot of vocabulary it's not going to change how you speak because the bulk of your listening is probably going to still be from whatever accent you found the most you know attractive or interesting or or, or useful for you uh, so uh, interest in, in the content is so key the other thing and and here it's a pity that I, I, I should have some quotes from Ruben Malvis, but he, one of the things he said was, nothing destroys the pleasure of reading as much as having to answer questions about what was in what you read, why someone did something, analyzing the text, any of those things just destroy the pleasure of reading. And they do it all the time. They do it in schools, they do it in literary, literary programs, and they do it in language learning. For example, here is one of the best um, sort of sources of good content that I found after about a year or so into uh, into my Russian. Uh, I happened to find it while I was in Tucson of all places in their university bookstore. Advanced Russian through history. Sounds great. It's got uh, however many lectures, mini lectures, 35 mini lectures taking you from the beginning of Russian history right through to modern times. Great. They make a point of saying that the text is different from the audio. Why would they possibly do that? They think that has some pedagogical value. So you, you, you read this text, but then they have another little mini lecture about this text, which in fact is not the same as the text that's in the book. And then they have, for the teachers, they have here, about the learning tasks, they have a total of 25 tasks, pre-reading tasks, complete before reading the text, Pre-reading tasks, read and reflect before reading the text. Reading tax, tasks, complete upon successive re-readings of the text. And then post-reading tasks. And, and uh, so, you know, stuff like uh, locate important places on a map and explain why these places are important. Generally, I mean, all kinds of stuff that would just destroy for me any interest I would have in these texts. To me, I just want to read them, ideally listen to the same uh, as the text, and then move on to the next one. And out of a book like this, I mean, if we had this at Link and I wrote them and said, can we put this on Link? I mean, I would glean lots of words relevant to history. Uh, they said no. Anyway, that's one example. I mean, the other, the other um, end of the spectrum was this uh, Korean book where lots of useless grammatical explanations and very little, very little text. So content uh, if you are forced and driven by your interest in the content, this has been my experience, uh, you know, with with Czech. I mean, I've been at it now for six months. I, I don't know how many hours a day I put in, maybe one on average, one, one and a half, two, I don't know. Uh, so let's say that's 180 days or hours or 200 hours, I don't know. I can read the newspaper, depending on the subject, of course. If it's on economics or world politics, I can read it. Uh, I have lots of words. Now I'm starting to speak. Uh, but I'm driven, like, uh, I'm driven, I can't go back to the easy stuff because I'm driven by my interest, what's happening in the Czech Republic, what's happening, what happened in Czech history, or I'm listening to uh, the good soldier Schweik, which takes me back to, you know, the early 20th century and, and so forth and so on. So, interest, content, give people things that are interesting to listen to and read. And if you can listen and read, you will learn to speak. Lots of people say, well, you know, uh, like I have often in talking to Chinese people, they'll tell you, Chinese learners that we have here, immigrants, they'll say, oh, you know, we Chinese, we all read well, but we can't speak because we don't speak in class in, in China and stuff like that. So then I say, well, how many of you actually enjoy reading a novel? Well, not very many. You know, in a room of 100, maybe one. 
So when I say that you have really progressed in terms of your reading, that means you can listen to an audiobook, listen to the radio, read and understand. And, and one other thing about, about listening, of course, it doesn't help to listen to stuff you don't understand. That's just noise. And that's why you have to have a deliberate program, which is what I'm doing with my check, of whatever I listen to, I want the text. Because if I just listen to it without the text, I miss too much. And gradually and gradually you build up that familiar, familiarity with the language that then enables you to focus on other things. And those other things might be, might be the grammar. You can get yourself a little grammar book. You know, or you can find so much stuff on the internet. If I, if I Google uh, conjugate check verbs, I get the whole picture. Uh, so I don't even need to buy a book for that. But, but those are the details that you go back and fill in afterwards. But the big, the big factor to me is, is content. Language learning should be content driven. How do we get people in touch with, with things that are of interest to them, that they can more or less understand? How do we help them to understand by giving them access to glossaries, by having a system like Link, uh, providing audio and text, uh, and let them choose things that are of interest to them. That's what the main, that's the main thing. And I should say that I'm confirmed in that opinion by the discussion that I had with, with Luca, who, who is a wonderful polyglot from Rome, who now lives in Paris. And he is absolutely, absolutely, he speaks extremely well. Uh, in I think we spoke together in nine languages and I'm going to put it up by the way here uh, on my YouTube channel unfortunately the webcam wasn't working so we're gonna put up two pictures and we're gonna run this discussion we had in English and Spanish and French and German and Chinese and Russian and Italian and Swedish uh, but he's the same way content get the language in you interesting content input key um, you know, I should plan for these things, but I, I had a bunch of other stuff I wanted to say, but I can't remember. But content is king. Oh yeah, I just wanted to add that some of the good polyglots that you'll find on, on YouTube, in the blogosphere, whatever, like Luca, like Moses, like Richard, I mean, they all have their, their little tricks for moving from input to output. And many of them are very valuable, and you should look up what Luca says, you should look up what Moses says, uh, you know, I don't know what Richard says on sort of moving to output. In my own case, um, to me, it's just a natural transition. At a certain point, I feel I'm ready to talk. I've started now talking in Czech with Yarda, Yaroslav, our member at Link. And uh, maybe the next time I talk with him, I'll, uh, I'll record it and put it up here so you can hear me bumble and stumble in Czech. And I just keep stumbling and bumbling until I get better. That's all it is. That's all it takes. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.